Hi everyone, this is Laura Pegram, the Manager of Drug User Health over here at NASDAD. Um, thank you for joining our call today, our quarterly drug user health call on innovative financing for syringe service programs and drug user health efforts. Uh, within this session, we're going to provide an overview of utilizing Ryan White funds for certain components of SSPs and drug user health efforts, uh, that's syringe services programs, and also we'll feature a discussion of the Virginia Medical Medicaid Section 1115 demonstration waiver to support your drug user health efforts in the state. So today we are joined by Amanda Bose, manager on NASDAQ's healthcare access team, who's gonna take us through that Ryan White portion. And then afterwards, we're gonna hear from Ashley Harrell, the senior program advisor within the Virginia Department of Medical Assistance Services, and Diana Jordan, who's the director of the Virginia Division of Disease Prevention at the Virginia Department of Health. Ashley's gonna give us an overview of the Virginia demonstration waiver that increases drug user health services within the Addiction and Recovery Treatment Services Program, or the ARTS Program. And Diana will reflect on the efforts of the Department of Health to partner with the, v, with the Virginia Department of Medical Assistance to increase services for people using drugs. I'm going to go ahead and toss it off to Amanda Bose to get us started uh, to talk about a little bit about the Ryan White portion and also reference, uh, mention a document that she and I have uh, collectively been working on here at NASDAQ that focuses on just that. Amanda, do you want to take it away? mentioning to you all that uh, we and the healthcare access team, that is Laura and I, are working together currently to produce a resource that is primarily intended for Ryan White Part B programs and data, but obviously um, would be available to you and helpful to a number of folks, including yourself, who may be interested in how Ryan White funds could be used um, in an SSP setting. And so that resource is currently under final development. We're hoping to release that in the next month or so, and we will have um, an accompanying set of webinars, one for our Part B and ADAP folks, and one hopefully for you all as well that will go into um, much more detail and offer some state examples of jurisdictions that have done this work with using Ryan White funds. Um, so stay tuned for more, um, but briefly I just wanted to mention sort of some key things to think about related to um, the use of Ryan White funds. So, Obviously, as you all are probably aware, the Consolidated Appropriation Act of 2016 um, allows federal funding to be used, including Part B funds, um, to support SSPs with the exception of funds not being used for needles or syringes. Um, so specifically, things to bear in mind as it relates to Part B programs or ADAP funding um, is that one, this language is reflected in their notice of awards as well in terms of the fact that they cannot specifically pay for syringes themselves, but generally can fund other components or other aspects of SSPs. Um, second, um, I also want to highlight that in terms of the conditions that they states have to meet, um, first, there must be a documented determination of need from CDC that approves the use of HHS funding, including Ryan White funds to support SSPs. Um, second, they need to have a certification of some form that um, the health officer in their state or local or territory, wherever these funds would be used, um, that it's operating in accordance with the law and is legal there to have syringe service programs in existence. And then finally, Ryan White programs must have prior approval and continuous approval from their specific HRSA project officer that the activities that they're funding using the Ryan White funds is allowable. Um, so of note, um, for those who may be not familiar, so with the exception of early intervention services, which I can highlight, generally speaking, all services or activities that are fundable using Ryan White funds must be tied specifically to the needs of people living with HIV. Um, so we get a lot of questions about sort of what that includes. So for example, PrEP is not something that can be funded using Ryan White funds because obviously the target of that or the recipient of PrEP are not people living with HIV currently. Um, but that being said, you know, the infrastructure can be used using Ryan White funds or can be supported um, for some of those activities, whether it's allowing other funds to be redirected to make room for that or um, by, you know, for example, funding staffing or other infrastructure that would also benefit people who may not be living with hep C. So that's the way to think about it. So in terms of the resource, we highlight a number of specific service categories or activities 
that are allowable under Ryan White um, that we think make a lot of sense to fund in an FSP setting, either because FSPs are already doing that work and could just be funded and supported further using Ryan White funds, or if they aren't, they make sense as somebody to provide those services or to bolster those activities based on the fact that they are seeing folks specifically who inject drugs, but also, you know, are well acquainted with and well prepared to expand in a number of different ways. Um, so some of those, just to provide you know, a brief mention, those can include, as I mentioned, early intervention services, which for those who aren't familiar, um, is intended to connect those who are um, unaware of their HIV status to testing and linkage to care and re-engagement to care. So if you're doing EIS, that means you have to have four core components that are available at the facility, even if not everybody's using all of them. So one is you have to have testing specifically. You also have to have referrals for services um, to improve people's entry into HIV care and treatment. Um, that can include direct referral to HIV care or other comorbid condition treatments that'll improve people's linkage to care. Um, the second is sort of allowing for access and linkage to HIV care and treatment, et cetera. Um, Yep, so anyway, so those are sort of, so the components are included and enumerated there, um, and that is the only service category that if someone were tested, for example, using EIS funds, who wasn't actually positive, they still could be paid for those tests using EIS, as long as the other components are in existence. Um, other areas that we wanted to highlight, or we you know, have enumerated is um, medical case management, for example, um, mental health services, um, outpatient ambulatory health services, um, substance use outpatient care, um, food bank or home delivered meals might be another option. Um, of note, that may also include the delivery of specific food itself or other household um, services or supplies. Um, so that can include like um, sort of water filtration systems, et cetera, things like that. Um, health education or risk reduction, housing, medical transportation, non-medical case management, um, outreach, referral for health care and support services, um, as well as if it's co-located, and sometimes it is, sometimes it isn't, um, residential substance use treatment services or referral for those services. Um, and then beyond that, there's a number of administrative or infrastructure related services that we would also encourage Part B programs to consider funding, whether that's funding specific staff or data systems or, you know, some select under limited conditions, renovations or equipment and supplies, things of that nature. So with that, um, I think I'm going to pause and see if there's any questions that might have come through in the chat related to what I have described. And just as a reminder to everyone um, to that the since this is a webinar, we are going to have to submit questions via the chat function. Um, so feel free to uh, submit any questions, to submit any um, you know exclamations or <laughs> um, right. Yeah, the slide is is there was not actually a slide, Patrick, um, for the um, for this portion. This is just a, a general overview of the Ryan White funding. Um, so yes, thank you for, for chatting that in. Um, just as a, another sort of uh, add-on note is that since Amanda and I have been working on this resource that we are going to, um, oh, I'm sorry, that we are going to uh, be having a larger, much more intense, uh, you know, intensive webinar um, once the resource has been cleared to kind of, you know, that will be available to both this list and, and others, um, you know, among the NASDAQ membership um, and anyone else who's really interested. So feel free, um, we will keep you in the loop about that. Uh, we just wanted to give you sort of a heads up about um, some of the work that we have been doing and um, you know, it feels like a very timely sort of thing that we've, we've kind of taken on. Uh, definitely, I've been hearing this from, um, as a need from a lot of health departments and then also you know, from, from HRSA staff um, who are also starting to look at, at the ways that they can unify um, the messaging to their project officers. So more to come. Yeah, and I should also add that it is our hope that this uh, resource will be helpful not only to you all, but to RB programs to better understand what is 
available or what are options to them because to Laura's point there might be some differences among product officers okay. or there just may be some instances in which health, um, health departments are really struggling to identify service categories or activities mm -hmm. that make the most sense to fund in an FSP. Okay. Um, so we're hoping that this really starts the conversation and obviously we would hope that Part B programs and ADAPs work closely with existing SSPs in their jurisdiction or those who would actually be in theory funded to deliver these services to really identify sort of what are the specific needs in their jurisdiction and the ways that the Part B funds would be most helpful to be used. Great. Any other any other chat questions about that right now before we move on to sort of this other idea about using a, a Medicaid waiver? Um, to, to expand services um, or bolster services for, for drug user health efforts. All right, seeing none, I bet you can all see none as well because I'm sharing my screen, so <laughs> apologies for that. But um, thank you, Amanda, for that overview. It's really super helpful. Um, I know there are a lot of questions that come up around this. Um, and so more to be, you know, this is sort of the teaser, I think, for that one and uh, more later. Um, it looks like we have a comment um, that someone does have lots of questions. Um, so you can't wait until the resource comes out. You can also reach out to us directly <laughs> ahead of time if you have any immediate questions um, that you don't want to wait on the resource to answer. Mm -hmm. We're happy to do that too. Yeah. We've been thinking about it a lot. Yeah. <laughs> Very much so. Okay, great. All right. So I think that that is a sign that we are going to go ahead and move on. And our next presentation is. Okay, is from Ashley Harrell, who is a licensed clinical social worker in the state of Virginia, um, and she is going to take us through um, sort of their arts, their addiction and recovery treatment services, and how their Medicaid waiver, which is an 1115 demonstration project, um, has helped to kind of bolster those services and some of the um, some of the some of the effects they've seen. So, Ashley, are you ready to go? I'm ready. Thank you, Laura. Thanks. I appreciate that. Um, so, uh, hi again, this is Ashley Harrell, and thank uh, you and NASDAQ for letting me come on and talk about our efforts in Virginia with implementing the demonstration waiver. Um, so you could go to the next slide, Laura. Um, what I hope to cover for you today and to be able to take away um, are some of the innovative efforts that you can do with a substance use disorder um, 1115 demonstration waiver, as well as implementing evidence-based programs. Um, so I want to be able to talk about our evidence-based medication-assisted treatment program, um, as well as some highlights we uh, implemented in April of 2017. So we've just finalized our first year evaluation with the Virginia Commonwealth University. So I'll share with you some of those highlights. And then in order for this to be a successful implementation, it takes a lot of um, working with um, sister agencies, providers, managed care organizations. So I'll share with you a little bit about our partnerships um, and then also some training initiatives that we have done uh, throughout the year. So the next slide it shows you a little bit about what Virginia Medicaid looks like. Uh, we have about one in eight Virginians that rely on Medicaid for their behavioral health and medical care coverage. About one in three births in Virginia are covered by Medicaid. And about 33% of kids are covered by Medicaid or our famous program, which is our, our CHIP program. And then two in three nursing facility residents are supported by Medicaid, which covers about 62% um, of our uh, long-term services and supports um, are spent within the community. Um, and currently Medicaid covers about 1.3 million Virginians um, that will expand. We did get approval from our General Assembly to expand Medicaid um, effective January of next year. Um, so that's going to treat about 400,000 um, currently uninsured adults, um, which is we're estimating about 20,000 of those based on other states that have expanded Medicaid um, could have a substance use disorder, specifically opiate use disorder. Next slide. Um, this shows you that even though the majority of our members are parent care, caregiver relative pregnant women uh, groups and children and low-income families, um, 
the cost of our uh, delivery system is driven by 23% of our population, which are individuals with disabilities and older adults, which constitutes about 68% of our expenditures. Um, the next slide shows you um, the impact of the opiate epidemic uh, with uh, members that are enrolled in Medicaid. Uh, and so this it shows that uh, beneficiaries that are ages 18 to 64 have a higher rate of opiate use disorder compared to individuals that are privately insured. And uh, that constitutes about 12% of um, individuals that are not in institutions. Um, about one quarter of those have an opiate use disorder. Medicaid beneficiaries nationally are prescribed pain relievers at higher rates than those that are privately insured, and thus they have a higher risk of overdose and other negative outcomes, um, both with prescription drug use um, as well as using illegal opioids such as heroin and um, fentanyl. Next slide, please. So in 2016, our legislatures approved for Virginia Medicaid to do um, a transformation of our substance use disorder benefit. Um, and this was addressed in kind of six main buckets um, that we had to do in order to implement the, the changes. One was expanding uh, short-term substance use inpatient detoxification to all members. Uh, we also had to expand uh, substance use disorder residential treatment to all Medicaid enrolled members. Previously, it was, uh, residential treatment was only available to pregnant women and kids. We increased reimbursement rates um, for existing treatment services, uh, which was very important. Uh, when we started covering substance use disorder treatment for adults back in 2009, we had not had a rate increase, and even one year had a rate decrease for one of the services. So this was significant. We also implemented peer recovery supports, um, both on the substance use disorder treatment side, as well as our mental health um, treatment side. Uh, and we did, we transitioned these services to managed care and by contract required each of our managed care organizations to have a um, substance use disorder uh, care coordinator available. Uh, with each of our health plans and then with all of this we realized we can build a ship but if individuals don't know how to use it and don't know how to implement evidence-based practices um, it wouldn't be successful so we had a significant um, training initiative um, as well as uh, provider recruitment initiative during the implementation the so next slide uh, the substance use disorder 1115 demonstration waiver allows for states to draw down federal matching funds for institutes of uh, mental disease, which are our substance use residential treatment facilities that have greater than 16 beds. And so that significantly impacted our residential treatment facilities across Virginia to be able to receive Medicaid reimbursement um, and increase their bed capacity. Another significant component of the 1115 waiver is that we had to implement a nationally recognized evidence-based practice. Um, and so with our work group determined to use the American Society of Addiction Medicine to have that evidence-based continuum of addiction treatment. And then also with the waiver, it was required to have a um, robust independent uh, evaluation. And so we're working um, closely with our Virginia Commonwealth University. Next slide. This shows you the umbrella of what falls under our uh, substance use disorder benefit, which in Virginia we call the Addiction and Recovery Treatment Services Benefit or the ARTS Benefit. So you can see starting to the left, it covers um, the full continuum of the American Society of Addiction Medicine. So we have our inpatient detox. So if somebody presents to the emergency room and is in need of medical detoxification, health system can actually admit a person if medically necessary um, to receive that service and get reimbursed. We now cover residential treatment for all members, partial hospitalization, intensive outpatient, opiate treatment programs, which are the um, our opioid clinics that can prescribe uh, buprenorphine, but also methadone. And then we have a new service, which I'll talk about is our preferred office-based opioid treatment program. We also cover substance use disorder case management, and then a new uh, benefit was our peer recovery support. And a big component of this is Virginia is a managed care state, so 
close to around 95% of our members are enrolled in managed care. Um, so it was very important for us to carve this into our managed care contract so that our NCOs cover not only the medical and traditional behavioral health services, but now they cover um, the substance use disorder treatment. Um, so it's kind of like a one-stop one shop for members and providers to coordinate care. So we also have a behavioral health services administrator that will cover um, our members that are enrolled in a fee-for-service before they transition to managed care. Um, so they coordinate both behavioral health and the substance use disorder treatment for those members. Um, so the next slide kind of shows you how this aligns with the ASAM continuum of care. Um, from we covered the early intervention is really the screening, brief intervention, referral to treatment or expert, um, going from outpatient services, which are traditional outpatient services um, that a member can receive. Uh, ASAM level two is our intensive outpatient and partial hospitalization. The ASIN Level 3s are our residential type services, and then we have, of course, our ASIN Level 4, which is our inpatient services. Um, Virginia, following the ASIN uh, model, members can enter treatment at any stage that they need. Um, they can transition to a lower level of care as they become more stable. If they relapse or if that particular level is not meeting their need, they can go to a higher level of care. So this is supposed to be a fluid process um, meeting the member where they are um, clinically and medically um, in order to be able to provide those treatment services. Um, so the next slide, I want to talk about the um, opiate epidemic where Virginia's um, health commissioner in 2017, I believe, uh, issued a state of emergency uh, with the opioid epidemic. So um, this was an all-state effort to address what was going on in Virginia. So part of this was uh, for Medicaid was increasing access to the evidence-based medication-assisted treatment, where we see not only are you providing medication, but you're also providing the counseling and the care coordination to supplement uh, members that are receiving medication-assisted treatment. We wanted to improve the quality of care uh, that was being provided for MAT. We also wanted to decrease emergency room uh, visits for members that were presenting at ED visits for opiate use disorder. And then, of course, ultimately reduce the number of overdoses uh, that we are experiencing. Next slide. Um, so the first thing was looking at how can we increase access to evidence-based medication-assisted treatment. And so this was implementing um, what we call our preferred office-based opioid treatment program or our preferred OBOT. And so that is where you have members that work directly with a buprenorphine waiver practitioner, which can be a physician, nurse practitioner, or a physician assistant, along with a licensed mental health uh, provider. Um, also within this practice, nurses are very integral um, with this setting. And then some additional members that might be a part of that preferred OBOT model could be the pharmacist peer recovery specialist, um, as well as we have implemented a new care coordination model um, for these practices that will allow um, someone to help coordinate care between the members of the team, uh, the clinicians, and the buprenorphine waiver practitioner. Next slide. So this is kind of the bucket of what we um, consider our OBOT, there are additional services that they can build, um, but these were some new codes that we created. One was for the day one of the physician uh, or the practitioner doing the induction, and that's paid at $140 per encounter. And then we have our counseling codes, which pay at a slightly higher rate than our traditional psychotherapy codes. And this, again, is by a licensed um, clinician, and uh, that would be $24 for an individual 15-minute unit and $7.25 for a 15-minute per group uh, per member. And then we have uh, the substance use care coordination, which is um, billed per member for the month, and that's $243 um, for them to provide that service. Um, so we will be, of course, looking at these services over the next year or so to look at outcomes as well as our other services that um, have higher reimbursement rates, such as intensive outpatient and partial hospitalization, uh, to look at 
uh, what the, the outcomes are for members that are receiving services. Um, and so that's more to come. And then next slide, this just shows you uh, the critical elements for uh, states that are implementing uh, preferred robots. This took significant engagement with um, our sister state agencies, our Department of Behavioral Health, um, our Virginia Department of Health, our managed care health plans, and of course, our providers and experts in the field to help us design and implement this model. Um, we, since this isn't, um, we learned from other states um, to look at what we do is the Medicaid agency actually looks at applications for providers that are wanting to become a preferred OBOT to make sure that they meet the criteria as far as therapies being provided, staff, um, the requirements that are uh, needed as far as weekly to monthly treatment plans. And once the Medicaid agency reviews this and approves a practice as a preferred OBOT, we in then turn notify our managed care health plans and then they will credential uh, those uh, providers for the preferred OBOT and then they receive certain um, benefits such as the higher rates that I just showed you, um, not requiring uh, service authorizations for prescriptions for buprenorphine that are less than 16 milligrams. Um, we have provided extensive trainings to our preferred OBOTs as far as billing, um, how to setting up practices to make it effective, a regular calls with our um, our providers as well as our health plans to address any issues they may be having as we're implementing. Um, and then also do the training. Uh, so our Department of Health uh, during the first year prior to implementation and during implementation um, went across the state and trained close to 850 clinicians on addiction disease management. And a part of that was also the training needed for practitioners to apply for their buprenorphine waiver through um, SAMHSA. And then that led with the 250 newly waivered prescribers um, at implementation for ART. And then we also are currently uh, offering bi-weekly Project ECHO learning collaboratives with our preferred OBOTs to um, discuss different various clinical things they may be experiencing within uh, their practices and to discuss particular case studies that may um, need some feedback from other clinicians on how to um, work through some difficult issues. So with the next slide, I'm just gonna kind of quickly cover some outcomes with uh, the first year uh, after ARTS was implemented. You can see here that uh, we have increased our um, capacity with substance use disorder practitioners um, before ARC was um, 1,087 practitioners that were billing for claims that had a substance use diagnosis, and that increased to um, 2,965. Uh, the next slide shows you kind of the breakdown of what um, these outpatient providers look like. So a 500% increase in physicians, 650 increase in nurse practitioners, we had a 52% increase in counselors, licensed uh, professional counselors and social workers, and 50% um, bucket of other practitioners. So this was a significant change for our outpatient community services. Then the next slide breaks it down by um, providers that we captured by claims that were uh, serving members with an opiate use disorder based on the diagnosis. So we had a 137% increase of outpatient providers providing opiate use disorder treatment. And you can see the following breakdown, most significantly an increase in uh, physicians as well as nurse practitioners. And then most telling on the next slide, um, this is pretty exciting. Uh, overall, uh, we have 440 new um, addiction treatment sites in Virginia. Um, again, our hospital systems are now able to bill for um, inpatient detoxification. We had um, a significant increase in residential treatment providers. We have currently 94 sites in Virginia that provide addiction treatment services. All of our partial hospitalization programs that are licensed in the state um, are now uh, Medicaid providers. 
we had a significant increase in intensive outpatient. Um, and then most interestingly, our opiate treatment programs that were licensed throughout the state were primarily cash clinics for four arts. And now we have 39 that are participating in the Medicaid program. And then the preferred OBOTs, you can see here, this was a new service and we now have 91 of sites that are providing treatment. The next slide shows you some characteristics of our members. Um, we have more than 20,000 members um, with an opiate use disorder that were served uh, through the first year of ARTS. We're expecting about the same number of members with our expansion population to have an opiate use disorder. Uh, we have about 30,000 members uh, have a substance use disorder, including alcohol use, use disorder, as well as other legal or illegal drugs. Um, the opiate use disorder diagnoses increased by 15% during the first year. And about a two thirds of these are female, but kind of interestingly, uh, members with opiate use disorder uh, were primarily white and ages 45 years and older. The next slide shows you the number of members receiving treatment uh, for substance use and opiate use disorder before and after ART. Um, so we had a 57% increase of members receiving substance use disorder treatment and most significantly a 48% increase in members with opiate use disorder receiving treatment. The next slide shows you uh, that how with this benefit, we are providing more services and reaching out to more members seeking treatment. So more than 40% of members with a substance use disorder um, receive treatment during the first year of ART. Uh, nearly two in three members with an opiate use disorder receive treatment, and that's 63%. And then treatment rates with alcohol use disorder uh, nearly doubled in the first year of implementation. The next slide shows you uh, hospitalizations uh, and that we saw a decrease in uh, inpatient hospitalizations with members um, with opiate use disorder um, as more significantly than substance use disorder. But you can see the trend here that without art, um, that we would have seen more of a, a steady line, trend line with members being admitted to the hospitals for opiate use disorder. The next slide shows you the outcomes with um, pharmacotherapy. Um, so during the first 12 months of ARTS, uh, the number of members with an opiate use disorder that received any type of pharmacotherapy, such as buprenorphine, methadone, or naltrexone, increased by 34%. Um, specifically with buprenorphine, uh, that was a 22% increase. And methadone treatment, um, uh, increased by 40% uh, after ARTS implementation. The next slide shows uh, the first nine months of ARTS and the total number of prescriptions uh, for opioid train pain relievers. So there were some changes with Virginia implementing the CDC guidelines as well as our Board of Medicine implementing new regulations for prescribing uh, opioids for pain relief. And you can see here that the total number of prescriptions for opioid pain medication decreased by 27%. And the number of prescriptions per 10,000 members decreased 28%. And so what we saw is that uh, members that were truly in need of opioid pain relievers still received the medications, but at a lower dose. So the next slide talks about the CDC opioid uh, guidelines that we implemented in our fee-for-service program in July of 2016. Uh, so what we did was we uh, removed the prior authorization requirement for non-opioid pain relievers to help increase access. We implemented a prior authorization for short acting opioids that are greater than 10 days and the prior off for all long-acting long opioids. We also required uh, for practitioners uh, and pharmacists to check the prescription monitoring program before prescribing uh, certain medications. We require that urine drug screens are required for all treatments that are, um, that are lasting longer than 60 days. 
Uh, we removed the prior authorization requirement for the minoxin injection and the nasal spray, and that the physician and patient agreements establishes goals and addresses the benefits and harms of opioids. So they have that dialogue with members. Um, and then with that implementation, you can see the next slide, we saw a significant decrease in uh, the number of opioid pills uh, and days prescribed. Um, and then after we implemented this with the fee-for-service side, um, the next slide shows you what happened when we implemented it with managed care. And we saw the, some of the same trends within our managed care organizations and the members that they serve, that this is having a positive impact um, on the number of pain, opioid pain relievers being prescribed and the, long, the, the longevity for them. Uh, the next slide uh, shows you that with these changes, uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, women uh, giving birth in Virginia, uh, about one in third births are covered by Medicaid. And so it's very important that we have uh, pregnant women, uh, that they have access to treatment services. And so we have more in, in Virginia, we have a, about 70,000 members are enrolled in Medicaid for coverage of their pregnancy each year. Uh, nationally, opioids are widely prescribed among women of childbearing age. Um, and because we know that around 50% of pregnancies are not planned, there are chances that women are on an opioid pain reliever at, um, and get pregnant and continue to take the, the pain reliever um, until they're they're knowledgeable about their pregnancy. Um, so with that, of course, that is uh, increases the incidence of babies born uh, with exposure to an opioid or neonatal abstinence syndrome. Um, and in Virginia, which is probably similar across states, or the a majority of babies that are born with a diagnosis of neonatal abstinence are uh, babies that are covered by Medicaid. So the next slide shows you uh, the VCU analyzed that treatment among uh, treatment for substance use disorder among pregnant women increased from 2% prior to ARTS to 18% um, in the first year after ARTS implementation. Nearly one in four women with an opioid use disorder um, received treatment in the first year after ARTS compared to only 4% in the year prior to ARTS. And among pregnant women with alcohol use disorder, 24% re received treatment during the first 12 months of ARTS. So the next slide uh, is just significant. Um, pregnant women with a substance use disorder receiving any type of substance use disorder treatment increased by 827%, pretty significant. And then the next slide shows you uh, pregnant women with an opiate use disorder um, during the first year of ARTS that received any type of opiate use disorder treatment increased 524%. So the next slide shows you uh, looking at outpatient services. So this is going to be psychotherapy services or services provided by a physician. Um, so you can see that any members who had any um, level of services that top line um, by all substance use disorders and then opioid use disorder compared to alcohol use disorder. But I think we had our most significant um, increase in the ASIM level one outpatient services for that first year. During um, all sort of significance, um, 622 members received care through the new preferred OBOT model as well as through opiate treatment programs. So the next slide shows you the decrease in emergency room visits. Um, we had a 14% decrease in ED visits for any substance use disorder and a 25% decrease in members with an opioid use disorder that were presenting to the emergency room. And as we covered um, in another slide, looking at inpatient hospitalizations, we had a 4% decrease um, for any substance use disorder and a 6% decrease in admissions for members with an opiate use disorder. Um, so just this next few slides, just talk about some uh, things that we're looking at in Virginia during this next year. 
um, CMS did come out with um, a state Medicaid director's letter with several um, requirements for states with 1115 waiver. And one of those was making sure that states are promoting access to the evidence-based medication assisted treatment model. And so in Virginia, we have um, issued a policy statement that by December 1st, our intensive outpatient, partial hospitalization, and residential treatment program providers have to ensure that members um, with an opioid use disorder are um, getting access to evidence-based medication assisted treatment, including buprenorphine. And this may be provided on site at these um, provider locations, or it could be through them engaging and referring to available providers within the community. This is significant because the use of medication assisted treatment has shown reductions in the overdose death rate of 75% compared to those that are not on medication assisted treatment. Um, and so we are requiring that when members are transitioning out of residential, partial, or outpatient, that that discharge planning includes a warm handoff uh, to, so that members can continue getting medication assisted treatment um, upon discharge. We have issued a survey now to providers, um, and the survey is due by October 1st, so they can describe to us how they're meeting this requirement. The next slide, um, again, just talks about our collaboration with our Virginia Department of Health um, that Diane will, be on, Diane will be on in just a minute, um, and our Department of Behavioral Health. Um, so again, this was promoting um, the buprenorphine waiver training to prescribers. Um, we're working closely with uh, Virginia Department of Health using the Project ECHO model um, to provide those trainings as well as our learning collaboratives for our preferred OVOTs. Our sister mental health agency, Department of Behavioral Health, trained over 400 providers in the American Society of Addiction Medicine. Um, criteria. They're also training peer recovery specialists so that they receive a certification um, and then they register with our board of counseling to be able to provide services and be reimbursed for Medicaid for peer recovery support and that we're also working together um, to, uh, and to, uh, to encourage our federally qualified health centers to begin providing medication assisted treatment. We currently only have two in the state of Virginia that are doing so. Um, and so, and also to help promote that relationship between our FQHCs and our local mental health um, organizations, which we call our community service boards, to provide that medication and uh, the behavioral health treatment services that are part of medication assisted treatment. We've also, the next slide shows you, we've worked very closely with our Department of Health Professions that licenses physicians, uh, nurses, and licensed uh, counselors. Uh, they have updated their Board of Medicine, Nursing, and Dentistry regulations about the opioid prescribing practices that um, implement the CDC guidelines. We're also working with our Department of Corrections to be able to offer trainings uh, to their providers. Um, to encourage the use of medication assisted treatment to be started in Department of Corrections so that members or the individuals are on medication and can continue medication when they're released. Um, so we're doing uh, some trainings uh, starting this fall. And then I think uh, just kind of the last couple of slides just talk about um, why Virginia has been so successful. Again, I think it is the stakeholder engagement um, that we've had, um, and very supportive partners, um, utilizing a nationally uh, evidence-based criteria uh, was also very, shown to be very successful. So we're all speaking the same language and members are getting the correct treatment at the time that they need it. Uh, it was looking at increasing Medicaid reimbursement for these evidence-based services. And then Virginia is beginning to look at the innovative value-based payment model um, to integrate behavioral health and primary care together. Um, another significant was a, a, a plus that was working with our managed care organizations to see how we can leverage our managed care organizations to help promote this evidence-based treatment. And so another um, example is with our medallion managed care 
contracts, which primarily serve uh, our pregnant women and kids. There were requirements for the managed care plans to be creative and have innovation, innovative um, activities to increase access to treatment for pregnant women and also to improve outcomes for infants born exposed to substances, including neonatal abstinence syndrome. And then another um, initiative that we have in Virginia on the next slide is look, working with our Virginia Neonatal Perinatal Collaborative. And this is looking to work with um, hospital systems and health systems to implement the SAMHSA AIM bundle um, to help providers understand how to work better with women who are um, have a substance use disorder or an opioid use disorder, and then how to work with them and their uh, babies once they're born and provide the most support and evidence-based care around that model. Um, so with that, we'll go to the next slide. Um, I want to share this is uh, for states that are implementing this. Uh, I think very helpful to have kind of an open door where providers and members can reach out to you for questions. So we do have a dedicated email address and we are creating a direct phone line um, and then also keeping available information on our website. So I wanted to share that um, website with you and you're happy to navigate through it and anything that you would like for us to share with you, we would be happy to. And uh, with that, Laura, I'll open it up for questions if there are any, or if we want to move on to Diana. Sure, Ashley, thank you so much. That is a, a very impressive presentation. Um, some of those numbers, I was like, really the whole time, I was like, ooh, this is, this is impressive, very impressive. So I just really appreciate you, your willingness to come and share um, and talk about all the good work that, that you all have done. Um, you know, and I feel like so much that, so much of the work that I do, it, it really, speaks to uh, creating those partnerships between departments. And um, even though NASA primarily just works with HIV and hepatitis departments and departments of health, um, you know, really this is no single issue sort of issue. And we are gonna have to find ways to, to kind of reflect on those partnerships and create new partnerships where it's necessary um, to really create comprehensive services. Um, Diana, uh, so our next, uh, presenter um, or someone who's just going to talk a little bit about sort of speaking to that partnership and speaking to how you guys created those partnerships um, and some of the comprehensive um, harm reduction services that that, Vir that Virginia offers. Um, we're going to welcome Diana Jordan, who is the Director of the Disease Division of Disease Prevention at the Virginia Department of Health. Um, and I believe that uh, Bruce Taylor is also on the line and he is in charge of the harm reduction program in general. So. Diana, are you on? I am, Laura, can you hear me? Yes, ma'am, how are you? Great, we had a little IT glitch, so we're all packed in Bruce's office, but we're <laughs> glad to be joining the call. Perfect. <laughs> oh, I was just gonna um, briefly add to what our Medicaid colleagues talked about and just um, talk about one of the other strengths of the Medicaid program in Virginia, that I feel like our Medicaid has been very proactive on infectious disease consequences um, that people who use drugs might experience and have really done a great job constructing services that are very low um, barriers to treatment for HIV and hepatitis C, and how that's made a really big difference in um, meeting all the needs of people who um, use drugs. You can certainly see from the ARTS waiver what a great comprehensive set of um, treatment services they've provided, but they have definitely been equally um, addressing the needs of the physical consequences of, of drug use. So I think that's been a, a great, a, a great um, collaboration. Um, in addition, I would add that our comprehensive harm reduction program is very new. We've got one site operating and a second one poised to start. But I think that the arts waiver has already shown its role in those in the first site that's operating, with the majority of participants being Medicaid beneficiaries and tapping into some of those services that you've heard about through um, Ashley's presentation. Uh, I think it allows us a really robust way to refer a client to seek comfort of harm reduction services into other care that they need. And we would have a much greater challenge without that partnership and without those services um, being available for our clients. And that's about all I had to share. So I think if the callers have questions, it'd be great to get the dialogue going. Great. 
Great. So thank you so much, Diana. Um, and like I said, Bruce is also on the line in case there are other uh, questions that come up specific to the harm reduction program. Um, so just as a reminder, we're going to go ahead and uh, we have some chat questions. Uh, that's how you should submit your questions for this call. Um, and I'm going to go ahead and sort of start off um, with some of with some questions um, that I have sort of preset and some that I have made just in the, during the call. But um, actually, I was hoping that you could you could tell us a little bit about like you know what you know about sort of how a state would apply for a Medicaid waiver um, and sort of like you know like what does that reporting look like? Do you have to you know, are there extra special things that you have to keep track of um, or report back? I was just curious, like sort of. Uh, you know, the how to, to sort of the great presentation you've provided. Right. Well, there is an application process um, that CMS has some criteria that states need to address uh, during the application process. Um, but when we applied, CMS was uh, very willing to have informal discussions with us to help guide us, because I think this is a priority for CMS. Um, and there are, for 1115 waivers, there are reporting requirements uh, that are due at least quarterly and annually. And what's pretty cool right now is CMS is coming up with specific metrics that 1115 sub-states are going to be required to use, and they're in the testing phase of it now. But they will provide um, specific measures, some are required, um, some are recommended, and states get to choose if they want to report on it or not. And then they will have specific um, technical specifications so that it's clear um, on how to gather the data to report it back to CMS. And then there's a little, um, some qualitative uh, reporting. Um, but it's, you know, I, I think it's something with um, our team here at Virginia Medicaid, um, it's myself, and um, my colleague, Keyshawn Harper, that have been working on that component of the reporting, and it's not overwhelming, but um, CMS is actually, I think, trying to align things so it'll be easier for states to report and then get consistency um, across states. That's great. Thank you. Yeah, we are happy. We have our application online. Um, you can also see if I don't know if we have our special terms and conditions, but that's the document that CMS sends back to states that has the requirements of uh, the 1115 waiver, but we're happy to share that um, so that you can see what the requirements are for Virginia. That's great. Thank you so much, Ashley. And just as a, you know, sort of side plug, um, we have a, you know, a, on our, um, uh, our health systems integration team has recently published a map with different um, different types of Medicaid waivers that have been uh, implemented across the country. Um, and we went to the extent to actually include um, the substance use disorder Medicaid waiver um, for the states that have adopted that um, and sort of the core components there. It's not all of them, but sort of core components. So you can find that on our website at nasdaq.org. Um, I, just a reminder to go ahead and submit any questions that anyone might have via chat. Um, Diana or Bruce, I guess um, I feel like you guys are, you know, I feel like your programs have the potential to use both, you know, partner both with Medicaid and with, with Ryan White. Can you speak to a little bit more to, um, you already spoke a little bit to the Medicaid um, partnership, but are there ways that you partner with other departments and other programs to sort of braid funding together for, for the comprehensive um, harm reduction program? I would say we spend a lot of time braiding funding. That's one of the main activities these days. Um, our first sites out of the gate, I think that we've been using primarily HIV prevention funding. Mm -hmm. And we um, are blending that with some of our ADAP rebate funding as well. And then we've used a little bit of state funding at times for some development work. One of our sites needed a little bit of help um, with developing their program, and we use a, we use some state funding for that. So we're we're definitely kind of taking a need at a time, and then figuring out the best funding fit that um, that we'll use for what comes our way. Hey Diane, this is Amanda. Um, I was just curious when you mentioned you were using rebates, my ears perked up, and I was just <laughs> curious if you wouldn't mind briefly mentioning sort of what you're using the rebates for specifically or what components. If not, like we can talk about it out, offline if it's 
more than can be shared in three minutes. We have last year. I was oh, when it comes when it comes to rebates, there's no secrets. Um, we're we're yeah. definitely we're taking the approach that um, what what we're providing is support for health education and risk reduction which is okay. certainly a, a service category on the Ryan White grant. And then we also are providing testing at all of our conference and harm reduction sites. So we're also considering it part of early intervention services. Um, we did a little research, I believe it's in the services, um, I'm gonna get my term wrong, but I think in the, the monitoring standards, um, it expressly uh -huh. mentions the ability to, to use funds towards syringe services programs. So um, the, the staffing part and the service part, we feel very comfortable using rebates and HIV prevention funds for the needles and syringes part. Um, we actually worked with a coalition of community-based organizations who applied together to a private funding source to be able to buy the supplies that they need. That's great. Thank you so much. Great. Super helpful. So Amanda, can I ask you really quickly one last question? Sure. So like, what do you think the biggest challenges Ryan White program might face in trying to set up bolstering services um, for drug user health or for syringe services programs? Um, so I think first is obviously having all the policy component parts that I mentioned in place. So you need to obviously have the statement of need is, you know, on the record. Um, I think that it can at times be challenging to get approval from HRSA project officers if, like I said, there's some variation or nuance that they're not all on the same page about some of the minutia of like how those funds can be used in SSPs. So that can be an opportunity to have some education, especially across HRSA staff. Um, so that's an area of concern. And I think, honestly, the largest would be that obviously, like any subrecipient, which an SSP would be one of, um, is that when a Part B program funds them for services, the Part B program must then ensure that they're monitoring the service delivery, that they're getting the necessary data for purposes of things like the Ryan White Services Report. Um, and so that oftentimes requires a certain amount of like onboarding or infrastructure development just to ensure that SSPs are able to meet those conditions just like any other subrecipient agency. So some SSPs exist in a broader clinics, so maybe mm -hmm. that may be no big deal, um, but for others, it may be a little bit more challenging. So the, the Ryan White programs would have to do a little bit more on the front end to ensure that they're set up for success. Mm -hmm. Yeah, great, thank you for that. Um, any other uh, Q&A or chat last minute? Uh, so did Virginia face any state political pushback behind public support for harm reduction activities or establishing SSPs? I, I suppose anyone could answer that. Yes. <laughs> that's, about it. That, that's, that's who you hear laughing. It was a, you know, it was really a hard climb in our state legislature to get it passed. Um, our first try failed. We learned a lot of lessons and we basically had to come up with a law that would pass. It's not our ideal law. So, you know, mm -hmm. I think that's one of our challenges. We were not able to get the legislator to vote to protect our participants. So that's really remained one of our big implementation challenges. I think because we don't have protection for our participants, it creates kind of a double bind for law enforcement where we're asking for their cooperation, but it means that they're not gonna enforce um, the, the possession law that you can charge someone with if they're carrying paraphernalia or paraphernalia with drug residue. So. I would say that's probably been the heart of the resistance. I would say over time, there's been more and more support as the opioid crisis has just um, shown why we need to intervene. You know, not, and I actually think that the arts waiver that, that got passed um, by our Medicaid agency has been a huge help because it's showing great outcomes. It's depicting what happens when you, when you deliver services in a way that's appropriate for the population. So, you know, I would say it's both a political success and a political challenge to implement in a state like ours that is you know, really diverse and, and pretty 50-50 as far as people's um, beliefs on these issues. Thank you for that. Any other comments to that? Any other questions while people are answering? Great. Well, hearing none, I know that we have blocked out an hour and a half. I feel like I do that just to be safe, but um, I don't want to keep people past the time and, you know, past the time when this feels like it is helpful. Um, 
Are there any other last comments by our, any of our panelists today? All right, well, I just wanna, again, say thank you so much to everyone who, who offered and participated here on, on the panel, um, on the webinar. Um, this will be available um, at some point, uh, sort of the slides and the, the webinar, hopefully, um, on our website. Um, again, NASDAQ, uh, it sounds like the, the Virginia Department of Medi Medicaid Services, um, you know, we're all willing uh, to share and to talk through any of this process um, and are actively thinking about how to create more comprehensive services for people who use drugs um, and, and syringe services programs um, across America, across the state and internationally. We'll just go internationally too. Um, <laughs> but uh, again, I just really appreciate everyone joining. Feel free to reach out to us if you have continued um, thoughts or questions or more specific questions for another um, for for another day. Um, and also just a reminder that, that we are going to let this whole call list know um, when we do schedule um, our, our next webinar um, that will be about um, our, our forthcoming resource about utilizing right, right money within syringe services programs. So keep an ear on, you know, to the ground for that. And otherwise, I hope you all have a great day. Thank you so much. And um, we, I will be in touch about our next regular health call in a month or two, okay? Thanks again. Have a good day.